The Crucible, Act Four. A cell in Salem Jail, that fall. At the back is a high barred window, near it a great heavy door. Along the walls are two benches. The place is in darkness, but for the moonlight seeping through the bars. It appears empty. Presently footsteps are heard coming down a corridor beyond the wall. Keys rattle and the door swings open. Marshal Herrick enters with a lantern. He is nearly drunk and heavy footed. He goes to a bench and nudges a bundle of rags lying on it. Sarah, wake up. Sarah, good. He then crosses to the other bench. Oh, Majesty, coming, coming. Tichuba, he's here. His Majesty's come. Go to the north cell. This place is wanted now. He hangs his lantern on the wall. Tichuba sits up. That don't look to me like his Majesty. Look to me like the Marshal. Herrick, taking out a flask. Get along with you now. Clear this place. He drinks and Sarah Good comes and peers up into his face. Oh, it is you, Marshal. I thought sure you'd be the devil coming for us. Could I have a sip of cider for me going away? Herrick, handing her the flask. And where are you off to, Sarah? Sarah drinks. We go into Barbados. Soon the devil gets here with the feathers and the wings. Oh, a happy voyage to you. A pair of bluebirds winging southerly, the two of us. Oh, it be a grand transformation, Marshal. She raises the flask to drink again. Herrick, taking the flask from her lips. You'd best give me that, or you'll never rise off the ground. Come along now. I'll speak to him for you, if you desire to come along, Marshal. I'd not refuse it, Tichuba. It's the proper morning to fly into hell. Oh, it be no hell in Barbados. Devil, him be pleasure man in Barbados. Him be singing and dancing in Barbados. It's you folks. You riles him up round here. It be too cold round here for that old boy. He frees his soul in Massachusetts. But in Barbados, be just as sweet and... A bellowing cow is heard and Tichuba leaps up and calls to the window. Aye, sir, that's him, Sarah. I'm here, Majesty. They hurriedly pick up their rags as Hopkins, a guard, enters. The deputy governor's arrived. Herrick grabbing Tichuba. Come along, come along. No, he coming for me. I going home. Herrick pulling her to the door. That's not Satan, just a poor old cow with a hat full of milk. Come along now, out with you. Tichuba calling to the window. Take me home, devil, take me home. Sarah Good, following on the shouting, Tichuba out. Tell him I'm going, Tichuba. Now you tell him Sarah Good is going too. In the corridor outside, Tichuba calls on. Take me home, devil. Devil, take me home. And Hopkins' voice orders her to move on. Herrick returns and begins to push old rags and straw into a corner. Hearing footsteps, he turns and enter Danforth and Judge Hawthorne. They are in greatcoats and wear hats against the bitter cold. They are followed in by Cheever, who carries a dispatch case and a flat wooden box containing his writing materials. Good morning, Excellency. Where is Mr. Paris? I'll fetch him. He starts for the door. Marshal, when did Reverend Hale arrive? It were toward midnight, I think. What is he about here? He goes among them. That will hang, sir. And he prays with them. He sits with Goody Nurse now and Mr. Paris with him. Indeed, that man have no authority to enter here, Marshal. Why have you let him in? Why, Mr. Paris command me, sir. I cannot deny him. Are you drunk, Marshal? No, sir. It is a bitter night, and I have no fire here. Danforth, containing his anger. Fetch Mr. Paris. Aye, sir. There is a prodigious stench in this place. I have only now cleared the people out for you. Beware, hard drink, Marshal. Aye, sir. Herrick waits an instant for further orders, but Danforth, in dissatisfaction, turns his back on him, and Herrick goes out. There is a pause. Danforth stands in thought. Let you question Hale, Excellency. I should not be surprised he had been preaching in Andover lately. We'll come to that. Speak nothing of Andover. Paris prays with him. That's strange. He blows on his hands, moves towards the window, and looks out. Excellency, I wonder if it be wise to let Mr. Paris so continuously with the prisoners. Danforth turns to him, interested. I think sometimes the man has a mad look these days. 
Mad? I met him yesterday coming out of his house, and I bid him good morning, and he wept and went his way. I think it is not well the village sees him so unsteady. Perhaps he has some sorrow. Cheever, stamping his feet against the cold. I think it be the cows, sir. Cows? There be so many cows wandering the high roads. Now their masters are in jails, and much disagreement who they will belong to now. I know Mr. Paris be arguing with farmers all yesterday. There is a great contention, sir, about the cows. Contentions make him weep, sir. It were always a man that weep for contention. He turns, as do Hawthorne and Danforth, hearing someone coming up the corridor. Danforth raises his head as Paris enters. He is gaunt, frightened, and sweating in his great coat. Oh, good morning, sir. Thank you for coming. I beg your pardon, waking you so early. Good morning, Judge Hawthorne. Reverend Hale have no right to enter this. Excellency, a moment. He hurries back and shuts the door. Do you leave him alone with the prisoners? What's his business here? Excellency, hear me. It is a providence. Reverend Hale has returned to bring Rebecca Nurse to God. He bids her confess? Hear me. Rebecca have not given me a word this three months since she came. Now she sits with him and her sister and Martha Corey and two or three others, and he pleads with them, confess their crimes and save their lives. Why, this is indeed a providence. And they soften? They soften? Not yet, not yet. But I thought to summon you, sir, that we might think on whether it be not wise to... He dares not say it. I had thought to put a question, sir, and I hope you will not. Mr. Paris, be plain. What troubles you? There is news, sir, that the court, the court must reckon with. My niece, sir, my niece, I believe she has vanished. Vanished? I had thought to advise you of it earlier in the week, but why? How long is she gone? This be the third night. You see, sir, she told me she would stay a night with Mercy Lewis, and next day... When she does not return, I send to Mr. Lewis to inquire. Mercy told him she would sleep in my house for a night. They are both gone? They are, sir. I will send a party for them. Where may they be? Excellency, I think they be aboard a ship. My daughter tells me how she heard them speaking of ships last week, and tonight I discover my, my strong box is broke into. He presses his fingers against his eyes to keep back tears. She have robbed you? Thirty-one pound is gone. I am penniless. He covers his face and sobs. Mr. Paris, you are a brainless man. He walks in thought, deeply worried. Excellency, it profit nothing you should blame me. I cannot think they would run off except they feared to keep in Salem any more. Mark it, sir. Abigail had close knowledge of the town, and since the news of Andover has broken here, Andover is remedied. The court returns there on Friday and will resume examinations. I am sure of it, sir, but the rumor here speaks rebellion in Andover, and it... There is no rebellion in Andover. I tell you what is said here, sir. Andover have thrown out the court, they say, and will have no part of witchcraft. There be a faction here, feeding on that news, and I tell you true, sir, I fear there will be riot here. Riot? Why, at every execution I have seen naught but high satisfaction in the town. Judge Hawthorne, it were another sort that hanged till now. Rebecca Nurse is no Bridget that lived three year with Bishop before she married him. John Proctor is no Isaac Ward that drank his family to ruin. I would, to God, it were not so. Excellency, but these people have great weight yet in the town. Let Rebecca stand upon the gibbet and send up some righteous prayer, and I fear she'll wake a vengeance on you. Excellency, she is condemned a witch. The court have. Danforth now, in deep concern, raising a hand to Hawthorne. Pray you. To Paris. How do you propose, then? Excellency, I would postpone these hangings for a time. There'll be no postponement. Now Mr. Harrell's return, there is hope, I think, for if he bring even one of these to God, that confession surely damns the others in the public eye, and none may doubt more that they are all linked to hell. This way, unconfessed and claiming innocence, doubts are multiplied, 
Many honest people will weep for them, and our good purpose is lost in their tears. Danforth, after thinking a moment, then going to Cheever. Give me the list. Cheever opens the dispatch case, searches. It cannot be forgot, sir, that when I summoned the congregation for John Proctor's excommunication, there were hardly 30 people come to hear it. That speak of discontent, I think, and Danforth studying the list. There will be no postponement. Excellency, now, sir, which of these, in your opinion, may be brought to God? I will myself strive with him till dawn. He hands the list to Paris, who merely glances at it. There is not sufficient time till dawn. I shall do my utmost. Which of them do you have hope for? Paris, not even glancing at the list now, and in a quavering voice, quietly. Excellency, a dagger. He chokes up. What do you say? Tonight, when I opened my door to leave my house, a dagger clattered to the ground. You cannot hang this sort. There is danger for me. I dare not step outside at night. Reverend Harold enters. They look at him for an instant in silence. He is steeped in sorrow, exhausted and more direct than he ever was. Accept my congratulations, Reverend Hale. We are gladdened to see you return to your good work. You must pardon them. They will not budge. Herrick enters and waits. You misunderstood, sir. I cannot pardon these when twelve are already hanged for the same crime. It is not just. Rebecca will not confess. The sun will rise in a few minutes, Excellency. I must have more time. Now hear me and beguile yourselves no more. I will not receive a single plea for pardon or postponement. Them that will not confess will hang. Twelve are already executed. The names of these seven are given out, and the village expects to see them die this morning. Postponement now speaks of floundering on my part. Reprieve or pardon must cast doubt upon the guilty of them that died till now. While I speak God's law, I will not crack its voice with whimpering. If retaliation is your fear, know this. I should hang 10,000 that dared to rise against the law, and an ocean of salt tears could not melt the resolution of the statutes. Now draw yourselves up like men and help me, as you are bound by heaven to do. Have you spoken with them all, Mr. Hale? All but Proctor. He is in the dungeon. What's Proctor's way now? He sits like some great bird. You would not know he lived except he will take food from time to time. His wife. His wife must be well. On with child now? She is, sir. What think you, Mr. Paris? You have closer knowledge of this man. Might her presence soften him? It is possible, sir. He have not laid eyes on her this, these three months. I should summon her. Is he yet adamant? Has he struck at you again? He cannot, sir. He is chained to the wall now. Fetch Goody Proctor to me, then let you bring him up. Aye, sir. Here it goes. There is silence. Excellency, if you postpone a week and publish to the town that you are striving for their confessions, that speak mercy on your part, not faltering. Mr. Hale. As God have not empowered me, like Joshua, to stop this sun from rising, so I cannot withhold from them the perfection of their punishment. If you think God wills you to raise rebellion, Mr. Danforth, you are mistaken. You have heard rebellion spoken in the town? Excellency, there are orphans wandering from house to house. Abandoned cattle bellow on the high roads. The stink of rotting crops hangs everywhere, and no man knows when the harlots cry will end his life. And you wonder yet if rebellion spoke? Better you should marvel how they do not burn your province. Mr. Hale, have you preached in Andover this month? Thank God they have no need of me in Andover. You baffle me, sir. Why have you returned here? Why? It is all simple. I come to do the devil's work. I come to counsel Christians. They should belie themselves. His sarcasm collapses. There is blood on my head. Can you not see the blood on my head? Hush, for he has heard footsteps. They all face the door. Herrick enters with Elizabeth. Her wrists are linked by heavy chain, which Herrick now removes. Her clothes are dirty. Her face is pale and gaunt. Herrick goes out. 